Did you know that the sinfonias of J.S. Bach are 33% more chromatically saturated than his inventions? In this short video, I'm going to talk about chromatic saturation in the sinfonias, and I'm going to compare it to some data that I uncovered a few weeks ago for the inventions. Stick with me for some extra facts, fun facts, <laughs> on these important works for keyboard by J.S. Bach. Well, hi there, it's me, Penny. Welcome back to my office. And we're talking about the 15 three-part symphonias composed by J.S. Bach during his Curtin period, his years in Curtin, Germany. And a few weeks ago, I put out a video where I talked about chromatic saturation as it occurs in the two-part inventions by Bach. And the inventions, of course, are written for two voices or two parts. The sinfonias are a little more difficult in that they're written for three voices or three parts. And then usually, usually the natural segue after that is to play some of the preludes and fugues in the well-tempered clavier. So this idea of chromatic saturation is a term that one of my theory teachers at the Manhattan School of Music used when we were exploring some of the movements in the keyboard suites by Bach. And it simply just refers to uh, the level of, or rather the amount of pitches from the 12 note chromatic scale that get used in a piece. For me, and I am no theorist, I'm speaking purely as a pianist, but this information is helpful for me because it helps me uh, appreciate passages in Bach's music that are perhaps more uh, musically intense, uh, dramatic, expressive, and therefore that require uh, a different kind of touch and tone uh, so as to bring these things out in the music. I think when Bach's music gets increasingly more chromatic, it suggests drama and musical expression and intensity as opposed to passages that are more diatonic or in the home key, as it were. So you'll recall, if you watched that video, and I'll link it up here in a card, <laughs> uh, you'll recall that I made this chart for the 15 inventions. And I made a, s a similar one for the <laughs> sinfonias. And so we're going to look at that. Um, but as I mentioned in the very opening of this video, the main thing that's of interest here to me is that the sinfonias are 33% more chromatically saturated than the inventions. 33%. It's a fair bit, right? Now, what does that mean? Well, I went through my, my copy of the inventions and sinfonias. I have a Henley text edition, it's excellent. And with my pencil and eraser in hand, <laughs> I did the tedious task of going through each of these pieces and uh, identifying how many notes of the 12 note chromatic scale were used. And as I found, <laughs> the sinfonias are 33% more chromatically saturated. Um, if we look at the inventions, the two-part pieces, and the word invention um, just refers to, uh, uh, I think uh, Christoph Wolf calls it, a freely conceived idea. The inventions, they're just musical ideas that get developed. Um, as opposed to the sinfonias, uh, I mean, those are musical ideas as well, but that term sinfonia uh, comes from uh, the Greek what is it? Sinfonia, meaning to sound together. <laughs> I like that idea better, better than uh, a musical idea, sounding together, right? Which is what part playing is, uh, many voices sounding together. Um, but this chromatic saturation in the two-part inventions, seven out of 15 of them utilize all 12 of the chromatic pitches. 7 out of 15. 
In other words, 47% of the two-part inventions utilize all 12 notes of the chromatic scale. And compare that to the sinfonias, I'll pull up my data here, <laughs> 12 out of 15 of the sinfonias utilize all 12 pitches of the chromatic scale. 12 out of 15, that's 80%. 80% of the sinfonias use all 12 pitches of the chromatic scale. 47% of the inventions, right? So 30, <laughs> ah, 33% more in the sinfonias. And that is worth noting. Right? Uh, especially if you're a teacher and you're trying to distinguish these inventions from the sinfonias, obviously the starting point of difference is that the inventions are for two parts and the sinfonias are for three. Uh, so therefore the sinfonias are more di difficult to play than the inventions. Uh, but now you have this added <laughs> fact that the, uh, the, the sinfonias are also more chromatic. Uh, they are also a little bit longer in length. I went through each of the inventions in Sinfonias and I counted the number of measures <laughs> and then I divided, I added it all up and you know divided by the number and uh, to get an average. And uh, they're pretty close but the Sinfonias on average are longer uh, the average length of the sinfonias is 36 bars. And the average length of the inventions is 33 bars. And within that, we have a little bit more uh, range between the shortest and longest pieces in the sinfonias. The shortest of the sinfonias is number one in C major. That is 21 bars long. The shortest... Uh, invention is number 14, and that's 20 bars long. The longest sinfonia is number 11 in G minor, that's 72 bars long. And the longest invention is number 6 in E major, which is 62 bars long. So this, these are some concrete <laughs> facts, if you will, <laughs> to help distinguish the sinfonias from the inventions. Now let's get back to the chromatic saturation. When we, uh, when we were talking in the previous video about the inventions, um, we saw that a number of them uh, did not use all 12 notes of the chromatic scale. Those included uh, number one in C major, number two in C minor, number three in D major, number five in E flat major, number seven in E minor, number eight in F major, uh, number 10 in G major, and that's a significant one. I'm going to come back to it. Uh, and also number 14 in B flat major. So those inventions uh, do not use complete chromatic saturation. And of those that I just mentioned, it's invention number 10 in G major that uses the least amount of chromatic saturation. Only nine of the 12 chromatic pitches are used. Bach leaves out uh, the second, the fourth, and the ninth note of the scale. If you look at the chart, uh, you know, down the left, I've got the, the, the title of the piece and its key. And then across the top, these numbers are the, the um, numbers of the chromatic scale. And the, the starting note, of course, is different for every piece. If you're in G major, then your first note of the chromatic scale is G. The second one is in G sharp. The third one is A, then A sharp, B, C, moving up like this. So um, number 10, as I say, invention number 10 in G major is the least chromatically saturated piece of all the inventions. And uh, for that matter, of all the Sinfonias too. I, I kind of think of the inventions in Sinfonias uh, in a way. I mean, they're different pieces. One is two voice, one is three. But I kind of think of them 
like the two two volumes of the well-tempered clavier <laughs> they're so similar in nature um anyhow number number 10 g major that invention very very much more diatonic than the rest of the pieces and that of course is the one that has all those broken triads in it um looking at the um at the symphonia's chart we see that the only as I, as i mentioned nearly all of the symphonias utilize all 12 pitches of the chromatic scale. There are only three symphonias that do not use all 12 pitches, but they're very close. <laughs> they use 11 out of 12. We don't have a single symphonia that uses 10 out of 12 pitches or 9 out of 12 pitches like we had in the inventions. Um, so in the symphonias, the three of them, which do not use all 12 chromatic pitches, are number one in C major, number five in E flat major, and number eight in F major. Uh, you can see that number five and number eight uh, do not use the fourth note of the chromatic scale, uh, and number one in C major does not use the ninth note of the scale, of the chromatic scale, which is G sharp. Um, and that's another interesting point. If you compare the two charts, <laughs> uh, the numbers across the top, right, uh, we see that in general, the notes of the chromatic scale that Bach most often omits are, well, that he most often omits is the fourth note of the scale, by far. Uh, and then the next most frequently omitted note of the chromatic scale would be the second note here, uh, and then the ninth note, and finally the eleventh note of the chromatic scale. So these are some things that are kind of worth taking note um, in your mind. And there was a w one more thing uh, in terms of this data that I collected that, that was interesting to me. And that is, in the symphonias, uh, when I was going through them one by one, <laughs> looking at every single note, um, I found that in a few cases, all of the 12 chromatic pitches of the scale were used within a very short time. I took note of that. Com uh, and those include, <laughs> I get excited about this kind of stuff, <laughs> right? Sinfonia number nine, which is an F minor. Listen to this. Sinfonia number nine uses all 12 chromatic pitches within the first three bars. <laughs> and how many bars is Sinfonia number nine? It's 35 bars long. So in the first three bars, all 12 chromatic pitches have been used. It's, it's extremely chromatic, and you, you listen to it, you play through it. Um, it you, you can see, I'll put it on the screen here, the sheet music, very, very chromatic, much um, use of the chromatic scale, literally moving chromatically. Um, as well, Sinfonia number 10 Oh, hang on, sorry, Sinfonia number 13, rather, uses all 12 of the chromatic pitches within the first nine bars. Sinfonia 13. And uh, Sinfonia number 13 is 64 bars in length, 64 bars long. And within the first nine, Bach uses all 12 of the chromatic pitches, right? So that, again, and interestingly, those are both minor mode pieces. Uh, the other thing, uh, yes, I mentioned about uh, number 10, Sinfonia number 10 um, in G major, and it uses all 12 of the chromatic pitches. However, comparing it to its mate, <laughs> uh, the G major invention, that, as we saw, used the least amount of chromatic pitches, only nine of the 12. So, you know, his treatment of the same key uh, from invention to symphonia is not necessarily the same. 
although in many cases it is, and I have some indications uh, here on the chart. Um, uh, so, the inventions and symphonias that have the exact same degree of chromatic saturation include number four in D minor, number five in E flat major, number six in E major, number eight in F major, number nine in F minor, number 11 in G minor, number 12 in A major, number 13 in A minor, and number 15 in B minor. So nine of the inventions in their corresponding symphonias have the same degree of chromatic saturation. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, th this stuff is all very interesting to me. Um, and these, this idea of the uh, uh, s inventions in symphonias, um, just, uh, you know, 15 of each, one's for two po voices, one's for three voices, um, they do not exceed four sharps or flats. Um, which I think is partly what makes these pieces a little bit more accessible to the intermediate player, um, to a player just beginning to play uh, part music, part playing, or polyphonic music, music in the contrapuntal style. And uh, so no more than four sharps or flats. And um, I, I gathered a, a, some information, again, from this book by Christoph Wolf called uh, Bach, the Learned musician. And uh, he was saying how um, Bach, I mean, Bach was just a little boy when both of his parents died. He was only like nine years old. And he lived with his older brother, Christoph, who taught him. Christoph was also a musician. And I read in the book uh, that Christoph, uh, uh, it was Christoph's teaching that helped Bach concentrate on the keyboard. And I also read recently, I can't remember which book it was. It might have been this one, or it might have been the Erwin Bodke, um, but that Bach composed his music away from the keyboard. Um, uh, that, that, is, that boggles my mind. <laughs> um, but these are all things to file away. You know, this kind of information is not helpful for, you know, piano technique necessarily, or or uh, imagination, or conjuring up tone color and uh, foot color from your pedal and all this, or fingering, you know. But I try to keep, personally speaking, I try to keep a balance of um, technical and um, this kind of data, and then more imaginative and analogies and things with books uh, relating to, you know, media studies and uh, poetry and whatnot, all sorts of things, um, and then about the history of, of great piano playing, and, and, and then much practice, of course, <laughs> and careful listening, and then I, th I believe that when I'm not at the piano, you know, when we're not practicing, and when we're doing the dishes, or we're having our walk, or we're getting our groceries, or whatever, that we might not necessarily be thinking about the music in those hours, but the food that we've put in our brain, you know, these various ideas are kind of cooking in, in the pot that is our brain <laughs> and mingling and bleeding over into one another. And uh, I think it plays a role in the, in the end performance. It certainly helps to keep me uh, motivated and stimulated by this music. I know a lot of people uh, are curious about, you know, how to how to survive the drudgery of practice. You know, oh, I don't feel like it today. Or how do you stay inspired? Th this is not something that I have ever had to face. Um, the challenge that, that I face, rather, is, you know, you know trying to make, make a living <laughs> as, a, as a musician, but not how to stay inspired. So there are different issues that we face. Um, but... If I had to try to answer that question, I think it would be just to stimulate your, yourself with as many different ideas as possible. I can remember when I was a student in New York, and um, you know I would be 
working on a theory paper and then studying for some some other test and, and maybe didn't get as much practice time as I would like and was frustrated by that or may, perhaps was frustrated because I couldn't get a passage a certain way maybe in the Chopin winter wind etude and I was struggling and just feeling helpless and like a total you know failure and whatnot you know we all have those experiences um even even though we always even though some of us always have the inspiration and the you know the the practicing is not a chore for me I'll, I'll tell you that much even though I face plenty of struggles trying to play this music well uh, and I can get very very angry and mad at myself um, it's not pretty <laughs> it's a good thing I live alone <laughs> um, but I love it I, I'm motivated to to bring this music to life but as I say at school I can remember times where I would go to a concert at, at the Eastman School of Music in particular they had some very famous musicians come I remember Teresa Stratus came um, and I got to meet her afterwards uh, she was a singer a Canadian opera singer and Marion McPartland a jazz pianist um, all sorts of different m musicians and I would I would go hear them or even my teacher Barry Snyder when he'd give a faculty recital you know and then I would leave that recital and I would think oh how did he do that? How did he get that color from the instrument? How did he do that with his pedaling? Ah, and then it would be like 11 at night, but it didn't matter. I had to rush to a practice room. <laughs> you know, who cares what time it is? Find a practice room and try to figure it out. So either going to concerts or listening to great recordings or finding a good radio ch ch channel um, that, that plays classical music perhaps, um, these kinds of things can also help to keep keep us inspired um but you know there's th this is this is not difficult just gathering this data and so you know you might want to set out on your own little quest maybe you're learning one of the uh little preludes or maybe you're doing a prelude in fugue um, and you're feeling a little bit stumped as to how to proceed well, just go through and, and look for the uh, chromatic saturation. Make a little chart and maybe compare it to another Bach piece that you've learned. And uh, you might you might <laughs> probe something in your brain that sort of lights a spark. Uh, but that is that is what I that is all I have for you right now. Uh, this uh, chromaticism in the inventions in Sinfonias, and as we said, the Sinfonias are thirty three percent more grammatically saturated than the inventions. So, happy practicing to you. And as always, I appreciate you being here. Thank you for your likes and comments, for subscribing. It, it's greatly appreciated. <laughs> and uh, until next time, happy practicing. Stay well, stay safe. And we'll see you again soon for more performances of Bach's music and practice tips. Bye-bye. <laughs>